this song says, by myself, it won't work. Lord, I need your help. And I can't make it without you. That's the whole gist of the song. That by myself, whatever I'm trying to do, whatever I want to do, if I'm doing it by myself, it's not going to work. I need the Lord's help. And I can't make it. I don't know about you, but I can't make it without him. So join us when you catch on to this.
Come on, put your hands together, church. Warm those hands up. Give God the glory. Give him the honor. Give him the praise. That's a fact. We can't make it without the Lord. I thank and praise God that I needed to be here today. I needed to be amongst the saints today. I thank God of how he put the body of Christ together that we are dependent upon one another. He gave you a gift that he didn't give to me. But we need one another. Stand on your feet today, church, as we prepare our hearts and minds. Oh, how I love Jesus.
Amen. If you can remain standing, Reverend Armstrong will come and lead us in our scripture. I've been healed, I've been free, delivered, I found joy, I found peace, I found grace. I've been free, I've been delivered, I found joy, and I found peace, I found grace and faith. I won't let it pass. So we say, I won't go back. I can't go back to the way it used to be. Before your presence came, so I. My shame, all my, shame. All my guilt. guilt, all my sin, sin. it's all forgiven. forgiven. Say no, no more change, fear my past. It's over.
together so I won't can't go back to the way it used to be before your presence came you changed me Lord you changed me Lord you changed me Lord I won't go back I can't go back before it came Before it came, so I won't. Can't go back. Before it came, it changed me up. So I won't.
never been like, I know that is mine. Jesus is mine, yeah, Jesus is mine. He is truly mine. Everywhere I go, everywhere, everywhere. Mine in the morning, no, no, no. all the day long, singing my song. The day long singing my song, Jesus is mine. He is truly mine. Yeah, yeah. Everywhere I go, everywhere I go, everywhere I go, I know that is mine. Mine in the morning. Yeah, 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 yeah. All the day. My song, Jesus is mine. He is truly mine. Yes, he yeah. is. Everywhere I go, everywhere, I go, everywhere I've been, everywhere I know I be. that it's mine. Oh, he's mine. Yes, he's mine. I said he's mine. Mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. 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 Oh, yes, it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. mine. Yes, it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. He's mine in the morning. He's mine in the evening. He's mine in the morning. He's mine in the evening. The city is mine. Yes, it's mine. The city is mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. Say yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say yes. There's something about that name, yeah. There's something about that name, yeah. Said there's something about that name, yeah. Said it's soothing on my doubt. Said it's soothing on my doubt. And it comes on my bed. Said it Say yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something about that name, yes. Something about that name. There's something about the name, Jesus. Say there's something about that name, yeah. Say there's something about that name, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's a mine. Yeah. Yes, he's mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said he's a mine. He's mine. Oh, yes, he's mine. Oh, yes, he's mine. I said he's a mine. mine. Oh, yes, he's mine. Oh, yes, he's mine. I said he's mine. Oh, yes, he's mine. I said he's mine. 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 Mine, 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 mine,
Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. Come on, y'all. Let's lift up the name of Jesus. Hasn't he been good? I would argue that he's been better to me than we've been to our own selves. And for that, we are thankful. Hallelujah. We are blessed. I love you. I love you. I love you, Lord, today because you cared for me in such a special way. That's why I'll praise you. I lift you up and I'll magnify your name. Because my heart is filled with praise. Hallelujah. I see y'all ain't feeling me today. <laughs> because my heart, ooh, yes, feel, feel with praise. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for this time of word engagement. God, we pray that the preaching of the word changes someone's heart. God, we pray that the preaching of the word changes someone's direction. God, we ultimately pray that the preaching of the word builds this church. God, and strengthens the ministries and strengthen each other's lives. God, we pray that everything that is said today might be something that would lead these, your people, to a stronger intimacy with you. Now let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer, may we all say amen. 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 Brothers and sisters, if you would, go with me. Uh, I'm perhaps like, metaphorically, like a cow. Uh, many times I like to chew um, on something before I finish it. So therefore, um, we are still in judges because I had to chew on it before I finished it, amen? And if you all would allow me to read a couple of verses from judges. I started out in judges um, on the first Sunday of this year, we want to go to Judges 6. Judges 6. I want to read 14 and 15, and then we'll skip. We'll skip to 20 through 24. There you will find these words. 
The Lord looked upon him and said, Go, and this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? In other words, what he was saying, how can I save Israel? And he's saying, look at me. My family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. We will look at 20 through 24. The angel of God said to him, take the flesh of the unleavened cakes and lay them upon the rock and pour out broth. He did so. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff and was his hand, that was in his hand, excuse me, and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and there rose up fire out of a rock, and consumed the flesh and unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. And when, I, when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face, and the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. Unto this day it is yet Ophrah and the Abrazites. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord told him to take thy father's young bullock even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy, thy father hath, and cut down the grove. I think that's enough. So just for a moment or better, I want to talk to you and use as a subject, get rid of the bull. Get rid of the bull. Before you jump me and fight me and say that Pastor Letcher is using vulgarity and uh, an ugly epithet I want you to read the word of God and understand that this particular text is telling us as believers to get rid of the bull. So why don't you say to your neighbor, get rid of, get rid of the bull. Get rid of the bull. I ain't gonna never live this sermon down. Brothers and sisters, as I look at this text and, and as I consider us in context, I understand that in our lives, perhaps we have some difficulties. Perhaps we have some things uh, that would get in the way of us serving God effectively. When I look at this particular text, I'm reminded of a story that I watch with my children where there was a young lady named Meg and um, Mr. Wallace, Charles Wallace. It's called brothers and sisters, uh, a wrinkle in time. 
where there were good people and there were evil people, but the good people were in search of the Father. And oftentimes, brothers and sisters, there are good people who are in search of the Father, but most of the time they have certain insecurities. And I want us to understand that in our lives as we walk on this short sojourn with Christ, all of us have certain insecurities that we don't want other folks to know. But I share with you that we have to meet up with our insecurity, our fears, and we have to meet up with them and we have to face them head on in search of our Father. I share with you this, brothers and sisters, it is because God calls those who he equips for the call. In other words, if he's called you to a certain ministry, if he's called you to a certain duty, God will equip you for your call, even though you have an insecurity. Y'all not with me today? You all remember Moses, don't you? Moses had an insecurity. He was a tongue-tied twerp. He couldn't quote the word of God, but God used him to free Israel. But brothers and sisters, sometimes we can hide behind our insecurities and our insecurities can become covers so that we can be insubordinate to the word of God. Our insecurity ought not allow us to be insubordinate to the word of God. And if we are not careful, our insecurities can cause us, brothers and sisters, uh, not to follow God. So if we look at this particular text, my Bible scholars, if you walk with me, we see that Gideon was insecure. Gideon was insecure. But one of the things that I share with you, brothers and sisters, insecurity is good because insecurity opens up a place for God to work. Insecurity creates workspaces in our lives for God to move. And inadequacies make room for God to operate. In other words, what I'm sharing with you, brothers and sisters, God cannot operate in our lives if we are full of ourselves. I wish I had one or two more witnesses. God cannot operate in you. And God cannot move on your behalf. And God cannot do anything for you if you full of yourself. First piece of this passage, uh, this passage that points us or highlights unto us, first of all, I see a power of perception. I see a power of perception. Don't you know your life is moved by your perception. Your life is moved by your perception. There is a power of perception. It's interesting that
has a different perspective than us. That's why I share with you, brothers and sisters, there is a power of perspective. I'm encouraged to know that God's perspective is always different than mine. God's perspective is always different than mine. When I see a dead end, God sees a highway. God's perspective is different than mine, and he can see what I cannot. Again, when we see adversity, God sees opportunity. And if you just take a moment to peek into the pericope, you see that God saw Gideon and God saw in Gideon what he cannot again see in himself. But if you allow me to lean into the text this way, I'd say that many times God has to show us his handiwork. Sometimes God has to show us some things that would happen in our lives. I wish I can share the testimony this morning. Sometimes God has to show us some things in, life, in our lives to change our perspective. What I will share is just the other night, um, my family and I got a chance to Netflix and chill. And as we were Netflix and chilling, we were scrolling through the selections and we, we came across, ironically, a show called The Bull. All right? The interesting thing about it is that it was a picture of a man's face. And at the first glance, I thought the man's face was looking at me. But it took another look at that particular picture to see that perhaps the man's face was not looking at me. Perhaps he was looking across your life. Amen. Y'all rewind just one picture. Amen. We so what I'm saying is, perception changes everything. And if you look at it, it looks like somebody is looking uh, to the left. But if you look at it again, it looks like somebody is looking right at you. Somebody's saying, well, Reverend Letcher, how are you relating it to the text? What I'm trying to share with you is that sometimes God has to show us some things, some things that perhaps may happen in our lives that would change our perspective in life. Somebody still ain't going with it. Sometimes God has to do some things. In other words, he has to do some things. He's got to do something to us to change our perspective. Well, let's look at Gideon. Gideon was hiding from God. And with Gideon, brothers and sisters, what happened in this text was God revealed himself to Gideon. Uh, he revealed himself. He, he made a miracle in front of Gideon in verse 21. It was no possible way in physics where fire was supposed to ignite because of a wooden staff that touched a sedimentary rock. But what somebody needs to know is that when you are obedient to the word of God, God becomes obligated to you. Gideon saw God's handiwork and at once Gideon knew that he served a God who is able to make fire 
spontaneously combust off a rock and some wood, what he began to understand is that God can make a way out of no way. God can do what he said. God can do some things in our lives. And I just challenge us today to understand that God can do those things in your life that you didn't know that he could do. God can do some things in your life. I want you to understand that as our seasoned saints say, that he can be a bridge over your troubled water. He can be water when you're thirsty. When Gideon saw the angel of the Lord, when he saw how God worked a miracle, Gideon, in turn, he made an altar. Verse 23, he made an altar. I know we walking through the text. If y'all just hang on with me for a little while, we'll be out of here. You, you do know we wasn't here last Sunday. I got a lot in me that I got to get out. In the ancient context, brothers and sisters, the altar was a fixture that was intended for one to come and to return to recurrently to worship God. In other words, when you come to the house of God and when you come to the altar, it was intended for you to come and worship. And I just want to say that anytime you see how the Lord has showed up in your life, anytime you see where God has showed up and shown out when he have, has performed a miracle, you ought to stop right there and make an altar. Is there any, anybody except me or beside me that sees a place in life and I stop right there and I make an altar? What I'm saying is, is there anybody in here that sees the place where God showed up in other words, it, it wasn't nothing you could do, but God showed up. Is there anybody in here that saw where God showed up and you made an altar right there? In other words, when I say you made an altar right there, you started to praise the Lord. You started to give God thanks. You started to share God. It was not me, but it was you. God, I thank you right now because if it were not you, I would have been. I should have been dead, sleeping in my grave, but because you cared for me. I'm pressing to my close. Brothers and sisters, anytime you see a place where God shows up in your life, you ought to make an altar there. Again, I share it again. What is interesting to me is that after building the altar, Gideon named it Jehovah Shalom. He named it Jehovah Shalom, which means peace. In other words, God gave him peace even in the midst of his storm. God, if we look at the text and if we understand the text, we read the text, God was preparing Gideon for a war. But what blesses me is that Gideon's experience with God was peace. Lord, have mercy. He was headed to war, but his experience with God was peace. So what I'm saying is, although we may experience crisis, 
Although we may experience calamity, although we experience things that we cannot handle, I share with you that God will give you peace even in the midst of your storm. If we're walking close with God, somebody said, and I think it was one of our prophets says, God will keep us in perfect peace. All of those whose minds are stayed on him. Grandmama used to say it like this. Brothers and sisters, she says, God will give you peace in the midst of your storm. Gideon knew, and I want to lean into the text this way, Gideon knew that in order to maintain peace, In order to maintain the peace that he had experienced with God, he had to deal with eventually removing the bull. So somebody saying, well, Reverend Lecce, you ain't got to the bull yet. So I'm getting to the bull. So there is a danger of distraction. Danger of distraction. Somebody said, well, come on, get to the bull now. We, so we, we got to go. It's cold outside. I'm getting to it. <laughs> that reminds me of a meme. If, if. The bull was an elaborate, it was elaborate, situated in high places. If we understand what the bull is, Baal was the god that Canaanites worked worship that infiltrated Israel. Baal, brothers and sisters, that had uh, gold horns and it had hooves, brothers and sisters, and they could see Baal in high places. Baal was an idol god, and throughout history, the children of Israel for the children of Israel, Baal was a distraction that took their focus off of the sight of God. Isn't it how, isn't it strange how the enemy, he finds high places to position elaborate bulls in our lives? Isn't it strange and isn't it ironic how, brothers and sisters, those idol gods seek to take our focus off of the sight of God? In the text, you identify the bull by the horns and the hooves. But in our context, we identify them by those things that hinder and hamper our walk with God. In other words, brothers and sisters, if you look at the text, the bull was set in plain sight. In other words, everybody was able to identify Baal in your life. <laughs> Whatever that is in your life that distracts you from your walk, with God is an idol bull that you must remove. I'm leaving you because I know somebody was distracted by the title. But Paul was able to identify those bulls and I pray that you are able to identify those bulls and the bull. Paul said, let us lay aside every weight and every sin which so easily besets us 
and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Brothers and sisters, I say this also. If we look at the text, removing those statues also re meant removing statues. Removing statues also meant moving statues. Removing statues meant uh, the physical cement being that stood before the people. But the statues were the edicts and the laws that went along with that statue. In other words, you got to not only remove those things that keep you bound, but you got to keep, you got to remove those things that keep you in place. All right. One last interesting detail about this story is that when Gideon removed the bull, he didn't take it with him. When he, when he removed Baal, he, he didn't take it with him. He didn't say, Lord, I'm going to take this down, but I'm going to try to handle it myself. He didn't try to take it with him, but what the text says is that he sacrificed it upon the new altar. In other words, what he did was he handed it over to the Lord. What I'm trying to share with you, brothers and sisters, there are some things, there are some idols in our lives that we cannot handle, but we've got to take them out of our life, and we've got to set them upon the altar, and we've got to hand them over to the Lord. I'm done. I'm done. I know I'm going to hear from y'all, but I, I, it's fine. I, I want to say this, if you look at the text, you will also see that there were people upset with Gideon because he removed Baal. Verses 28 through 30, you will see that early in the morning they got up. They got upset. They didn't see the bull. And they got upset because the bull was removed. I want you to understand that in your life, when you decide to take those idols down out of your life, there are some people that are going to be upset with you. There are some people that are not going to ride with you because you have decided to walk with God. The door of the church is open. <laughs>